I'm happy to report that today is officially the first day of June. Along with June is warm weather. It's almost 95 degrees, perfect weather to sweep out grain bins, especially these old ones that require a lot of manual labor. Either way, it's good, cheap storage, it's paid for, so it's hard to complain too much. I don't know though if I'd rather do it when it's 95 degrees and incredibly warm, or if I'd rather do it when it's zero degrees and frozen here in the winter. So it's the lesser of two evils, I guess. The soybeans over here look absolutely phenomenal. Vegetative growth is just at a ridiculous pace right now. It's hard to have any quorums with the start of our season other than we could probably use a good two or three inch rain. Hasn't rained very much in the last three or four weeks, which could be a problem if we go into June and July with warm temperatures and not a lot of moisture in the profile. Soybeans do not grow at the same rate that corn does. Usually they spend the first four to six weeks of their lives seemingly at the same size. You blink your eyes a few times and next thing you know they're on their sixth trifoliate. These will probably be flowering here in the next week. I saw some beans back closer to home that have already started flowering. Most modern soybean varieties are indeterminate, meaning that they can flower and vegetate at the same time. They will continue to grow more foliage and vegetative tissue, along with starting the reproductive part of their life cycle. There's a lot of growth yet to be done, and we sure could use a nice rain on these. Those are some good looking Don Mario 3756Es though. We've had a lot of luck with these beans. It looks like they're off to a good start. I've been walking a few soybean fields this week and I have noticed some water hemp starting to break through. As you would expect, it's mostly in our higher pressure areas of the field where we've had weed control issues in the past. Normally that'd be on your edges of the field or wet pockets where you've had crop damage. Those are always where you're gonna continue to battle large populations of weeds just because their seeds live for so long in the soil. You just continuously find them every year. The Zidjuas C we used was applied almost six, seven weeks ago. Really, that's pretty good coverage that we've just now got water hemp breaking through. You can't really ask for much more out of your residual herbicide. Typically, they say you're lucky to get four strong weeks. We somehow lucked out and got six or seven good weeks of control. We need to spray this water hemp because if it gets much bigger, it's going to be very hard to kill. Technically speaking, any good weed scientist would tell you that you should probably spray your weeds at four inches or below. Every inch they get above that, they become harder and harder to terminate. Water hemp especially because it has numerous growing points, meaning that if you don't kill every single one of those growing points, it's just gonna start growing again like a bush. You might as well just add that factoid to the endless list of reasons why water hemp is so troublesome to fight. I wanted to take a quick moment to give a huge shout out to the sponsor of today's video, Discount Lots. For those of you who are not familiar with Discount Lots, it is a cost-effective, convenient, and streamlined way to get started on purchasing your dream property in the United States today. There's pretty much no other place where you can find such an extensive amount of properties located in the U.S. at hard-to-beat prices. To satisfy your own curiosity, head over to discountlots.com or follow one of the links on the video and check out their selections. If there are any properties that stand out to you as something you cannot not live without. There's really no hassle to purchasing them. You add them to the cart, you use code DLTRIPPY10 to get 10% off on your order. There's no extra fees because the Discount Lots team handles everything. One other aspect that simplifies and shortens the process is the lack of credit checks. This pretty much means that about anyone can purchase their dream property. On top of that, with their easy payment plan, you can get started on your property purchase for as little as $200 per month. Zip on over to discountlots.com, check out that expansive list of properties. Use code DLTRIPPY10 for 10% off if you want to pull the trigger on anything. Thanks again to Discount Lots for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get back to the action. Speaking of weed control, there was something I'm proud of that I want to show you real quick. And no, it's not my hat. You guys have given me a hard enough time in the comment section. I've got a new one on order. You should order yours today too at farmfocus.com forward slash a trippy farmer. Do you guys remember this cornfield from our first misadventure of spraying corn? We had that rain move through and we were worried that our chemical got washed off before the rain safe period. I was about 75% certain I'd have to come back out here and respray to clean up some broadleafs that had that herbicide washed off their leaves. And much to my surprise, everything died. And when I say everything, I quite literally mean everything except for the corn that was in this field has been terminated. See all of those withered up brown plant remains on the ground? Those were once sprawling, thriving water hemp they met our good friend Acuron GT, a literal flamethrower against broadleaves and grasses out in your field, and they're goners. And I don't think they're coming back anytime soon. What was that saying? Knee high by the 4th of July? 
Might want to redact that and change it to knee high by the end of May because that's the way it's been for the last few years. Corn's off to a strong start. You can see where my dad definitely had two different hybrids in the planter out here. There's 60 foot of a different shade of green and another 60 foot of another different shade of green, some different plant characteristics. One looks like it's a stronger, quicker starter. The other one, maybe not so much. You really can't actually tell a good difference between hybrids until you run the combine through the field and see the final yield. I have no idea what two hybrids these are. I'm sure like all of our corn and soybeans right now, they could definitely use a good rain. At the same time though, it's only the beginning of June. We came into the season with a pretty full soil profile in terms of moisture. So I don't know that definitively we have to have a rain to get to July at this point. At this point in the growing season with the stage of our corn and soybean plants, a rain helps with root growth. I know that seems counterproductive because dry weather does enhance a plant's desire to go deeper with roots. At the same time though, when the ground gets very dry, it tightens up. That tight ground makes it difficult for plant roots to penetrate deeper. And at the same time, dry ground also causes a lot of nutrients to get tied up in the soil profile. You need moisture to get those unlocked and available to your plant roots. So if we could get a good rain, this stuff would grow even quicker and probably get a nice darker shade of green than it is right now. You know though, if I could buy a one inch rain anytime I wanted to, probably wouldn't be farming. Be on an island somewhere selling you guys rain who farm. You can see a little patch through here of some whitish yellow yellowish corn leaves. That right there is a telltale symptom of HPBD over application, also known as bleaching. The Callisto and probably the Bicyclopyrone, which are both group 27 herbicides. Went on a little thick here because it's probably where I turned my boom on and started going. Didn't get up to speed fast enough and it bleached the corn. It is typically stated that a little bit of bleaching does not hurt your yield. Although this looks like I may have put way too much right here. These corn plants are going to be behind a little bit and I would think with the dry weather, we may see a little bit of yield loss here and there. However, that is more of operator error. You look at the rest of the field, it is nearly picture perfect. Wheat harvest is drawing near. I've enjoyed driving by our neighbor over here's wheat fields because they look phenomenal. I'm far from a wheat expert though. I'd say probably end of June, early July for cutting this wheat. I'm not entirely sure. I can only imagine how warm that would be if you went out there to bale wheat straw. I've helped a neighbor or two in my day with that kind of project and that's hard work and the conditions are far from super comfortable. I've pretty much got a love-hate relationship with our rock and oil roads here in the country. They're great in the winter and when it's wet outside because it's not like a dirt road that gets all sorts of messy. At the same time, when it gets real hot in the late spring and early summer, if there is not boatloads of rock poured on top of them, you will quite literally have road oil all over your vehicle along with whatever else you pick up because that oil makes your tires super sticky. There's a give and a take there. I've finally gotten enough of a gap in my schedule to go break in that Kinsey replant planter, which means we need to run up north to our Pioneer dealer, get a few loose bags of untreated short season soybeans to throw in areas where we had planter issues or even just poor emergence, which wasn't really super common this year. Back at home base, looks like the boss man has been out playing around with the planter. It needed a little bit of maintenance done to it so I don't think he was actually planting. For replanting, we're throwing in a Pioneer 28A65 as a 2.8 enlist soybean. We always go with a much shorter soybean when we come in to replant because we want to make sure that these beans are ready to harvest when the rest of the field is especially this year because we aren't planting in any super large spots. There are some years where we have some major emergence issues or crop damage that result in a need for a large amount of replanting. That's a time where you could use your regular full season beans. And we're just patching in though. We're ready to hit the field. This thing's about as basic as they come. Finger pickup units, no vacuum, nothing fancy there. Individual row storage boxes. I believe they're a bushel and a half capacity. Ground driven, sprockets in the middle of the set population. 
You don't need much though when you're replanting beans. Okay, we're off to replant some beans. This eight row planter is a tad bit wide and a tad bit heavy on the 7330. You've got 20 foot of obstruction behind you here. So we're gonna have to be a little bit careful going down the road. We'll take our time to get these beans planted in. I also found this homeless man wandering the streets, picked him up for a ride. He's making himself at home and playing with the turn signals and adjusting my air ride seat. These beans right here do not need replanted. That spot right there on the side of the terrace though definitely needs replanted, so I figured I might as well at least plant my way out to it. Because I'm gonna run over at least two tire tracks through the field. The DB60 on the other hand destroys about a half acre for every acre you replant. So this is less intrusive. I was gonna blame the planter operator for this missing patch here. It looks to me like it just didn't come up for some reason. I don't know if the downforce struggled on the side of this hill, didn't get good seed to soil contact. The planter definitely planted through there, just didn't come up. Where were you in charge of planting that day, Lenny? You started to get some freckles being out in the sun. If you look to the northwest, Lenny, you can see that someone besides us is getting rain. Life can be like that sometimes. Rain? You, can you do a rain dance? Yeah, that's a pretty good one. We'll see if anything transpires from it. Okay, fast forward to the next day. I apologize, I did not end up filming a whole lot replanting. On top of running an eight row replanting rig like that being incredibly boring and not the greatest content, it's also a two handed job. Then you add in the third hand to wrangle your son because you're watching him while his mom's at a doctor's appointment. And then the fourth hand required to operate the camera at the same time. And it makes it just not a good opportunity to film much. Oh well, we got our three fields replanted. A few minimal issues. I think we will need a rain to see those beans come up because that planter is so worn out that a lot of those parts aren't going far enough in the ground to really establish the beans at a level where there's moisture. Today though, we are on to something arguably much more important. My dad and I have scouted a handful of fields over the last few days and decided it's probably about due time to pull the trigger, take the Hagee out and start doing some post application on our soybeans. We're gonna be starting on our Extend Flex beans. We're not gonna be using the Extend portion of that herbicide tolerance trait in the beans. We're going to be using the Liberty or Glufosinate. I apologize if all of these words make no sense to you, but that's just kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to farming and the chemistries and herbicides involved. From this point on, I may use the terms Liberty and Glufosinate interchangeably. They're the same thing. One is the trade name and one is the chemical name. Liberty is kind of a confusing word for those of you who aren't actually farmers. You probably think of freedom. And yes, it is freedom. Freedom from weeds. Like I said, Glufosinate is actually just the generic chemical name. It's like Roundup to Glyphosate. Glyphosate. Glyphosate is the general name for Roundup. Roundup is the trade name. Glufosinate is a much different chemistry than anything we've applied so far. The main difference between it and the corn products we've used and even some of the earlier soybean residuals is that Glufosinate is a contact herbicide, also known as a burner. Coverage on the plant is essential. A systemic herbicide can get a few drops on the leaves and be translocated through the plants, hopefully killing the entire plant. Glufosinate is a burner or contact product, I just said that. It actually needs to kill as much tissue as possible and kill the plant entirely as a secondary effect because it does not translocate readily through the plants. It may kill surrounding tissue from where the charged droplets land, but if you don't kill enough of them, many weeds, especially something like water hemp that has numerous growing points, will just come out of it after taking pretty hard damage. Because of this aspect of glufosinate, there's a few considerations you have to make when applying it to your fields. First and foremost, you're going to increase your carrier volume. Most products we've been applying at 15 gallons an acre. Essentially, this just means that regardless of how much active ingredients we're putting on per acre, we're diluting it into 15 gallons of water to act as a vehicle to distribute it amongst the weed leaves. Because we want that coverage, we're upping it to 20 gallons per acre of carrier. Each little droplet may have less potency of herbicide, but it will cover more of the leaf. 
which is exactly what we want. So we're going to run 20 gallons to the acre. And we're also going to be changing the tips on the sprayer to get a finer spray pattern with more coverage. As I was talking, I just noticed this. That looks like that's one bad hit away from breaking off. I don't like the looks of that, especially because I need to spray soybeans. Hopefully we don't hit anything. It looks like that was already rusted through, so I would venture to say it was already broken, and I'm not going to deny that I may not have been a part of breaking it more. I did not do the brunt of that damage, though. Rinse tank's full. You can tell because it's running out the top. Up until this point in the year, all three nozzles that we have used have been varying sizes of the T-Jet AIXR, air inducted, extended range, flat fan, pretty simple nozzle other than being air inducted. The air induction gives you consistent droplet size to help reduce drift and give you good quality even drops on the plant leaves. The only products that we've actually applied directly to weed leaves was our post corn application. Most of those products were pretty technical systemic herbicides. That's why the AIXR is a good choice. We are going to be moving on to a size six T-Jet twin turbo jet non air inducted nozzle here. This is going to be two 60 degree fans that overlap and essentially create a very wide fan of fine mist that also provide phenomenal coverage. Remember, coverage is the most important aspect of applying Liberty. On top of coverage, you also kind of want to spray it while the sun's out, especially if it's warm. There's been a lot of anecdotal reports that Liberty is a phenomenal herbicide so long as you apply it on banker hours, meaning from nine to five, and when it's warm outside and sunny. The plants need to be actively growing for the Liberty to infiltrate the leaf tissue and essentially derail the photosynthetic activity of the plant. I'm gonna go ahead and go around and put these twin turbo jets on. I've got about a hundred of them. I think I've got room in all my nozzle bodies. If not, I may just pull a few out here and there. I thought about the best way to think about good times to spray Liberty out on growing weeds. The simplest way I can put it is if it would be a great day to put on some sunscreen, sit by a swimming pool and enjoy some adult beverages and get a nice tan, it's a good day to spray Liberty. And I can tell you based on the sweat I already have this morning at 8.30 without even doing any kind of physical labor, it's going to be a good day to spray Liberty. You know what, this is going to be easier if I can unfold the whole boom. I'm just going to pull up and unfold. Disregard that idea because my tanker pulled in and parked in the only spot I can even unfold my boom all the way. I went ahead and put the rest of the nozzles on. I've got some clean water in the tank. I'm going to turn the pump on, get out, make sure everything's in operating order, and we're going to fill up and go. I apologize for the noise. I've got the air conditioner on full blast right now. I'm going to run a little bit through the booms. Okay, I don't have that much water in the tank, so i got to be quick. They have these all on the wrong way, I can't tell. They look correct, but they're also sending a lot of product against the boom, which is not the way they should be. I very well may have 100 tips on the wrong direction, which means I gotta take 100 tips off and change their direction. Oh, I made a phone call to Spray Parts Warehouse down in Newton to get some expert advice. They answered my question pretty shortly that I've got these installed the wrong way. Currently, I have them installed to where they're kind of fanning out sideways, when all reality, they're all actually supposed to be somewhat parallel with the wings on the caps, meaning I've got about a hundred of these nozzles to go flip real quick. That actually didn't take as long as I was expecting. It was time I had not accounted for nonetheless. The pace I'm going now, by the time I get done with my first field, probably be quitting time. I just came and snagged the replant planter. I think he's going to replant some stuff. I'm fire this up real quick. As long as not very much of it setting up on the boom, I'm happy with it. it. Looks pretty good. How's that? Looks like we're good to go, or maybe 99% good to go. Let's get some liberty in the tank. I should have all this figured out after spraying for about 10 more years. Then I can say I'm an expert. For now, though, I'm going to hang my hat on the rookie excuse. Sometimes you got to do things to figure them out. Tanker and our sprayer to make 
make sure we got it cleaned out. And now for the fun part, which is waiting to see whether or not we smoke the first pass of beans we spray from all of that built up Callisto and atrazine. It's very persistent herbicides. The transition from corn to beans is always the toughest. So we'll see here in about four or five days whether or not we did a good job cleaning out. Does that corn look like it needs a rain? I'd say so. We also had those tile laterals put in on this north end, which packs the ground pretty bad. It may take a year for those to come out of that. The corn doesn't have a year, but hopefully next year's soybeans, we won't see that. Here we are at the first field of ExtendFlex soybeans that we're spraying with Liberty. You may be asking yourself, Andy, the road is all the way over there. Why did you drive down to this end of the field, which is not close to any neighbors or roads, to start spraying? Well, that's a great question, everyone. One of the first things that experienced spray operators have told me is that regardless of how good of a job you think you did cleaning out your sprayer and your tanker, you should still always start your first pass of soybean herbicide on the back side of the field where very few people can see it. Because Roundup, if it's in your mixture, which I do have Roundup with our Liberty, will pull things out of the tanker, out of the boom, out of the plumbing of everything that you did not know could even still be hanging on. And when you spray that stuff off on your poor little soybeans, it may not kill them, but they won't look pretty. I guess we'll start spraying and we'll know the answer to that in probably four or five days, whether or not we hurt anything. I did a good job cleaning out, I know that, but that's not to say that something couldn't have hung around. sprayed one ring around the field, which with 120 foot boom is usually like a quarter of the field. Here's where I sprayed my first pass. Look at how well you can actually straddle 20 inch rows with 13 or 14 inch tires right in between them. I was hand steering that. I could technically row this whole field, but I'm going to spray everything crossways or at an angle this year. I don't see that being worth the trouble because I'm going to try to bump up the speed, and once I get going fast enough, the Hagee's going to try and walk, and then it'll be on beans. I had a hard enough time staying off our 30-inch row corn. And this right here, ladies and gentlemen, is the last time I ever spray a field crossways. Someone warned me about doing this in the comments, saying it's hard on the boom, and I could see why that's the case. To be honest, I thought this was going to be smoother. It's the way I sprayed my pre-plant residual. I guess from now on, even if it's a little bit shorter of a pass, I'm going to spray everything at an angle. I just finished my first short 60-acre field. I guess I didn't have enough in the tank because I didn't make it all the way to the end. And I did notice some of my plumbing here on one of these outside sections was a little haywire. I'll figure out which one it is. Well, this nozzle body looks a little elderly because it's got a little bit of a leak. I don't think that was the one causing the issue. There's a lot of moisture in here, so I'm almost betting it's this one. Let's go ahead and change this one and spray. If it's not that one, I'll put this one back on, another one, or whatever one's broken. These things seem to go bad a lot. I almost think that the atrazine has a lot to do with it. That stuff is just so nasty from a maintenance perspective. It's hard on everything. It gunks everything up. It makes all the valves act goofy. Even my sprayer master control valve seems to be sticking a little bit. And I'm sure good old atrazine. If only it wasn't such a good residual product and also great at spicing up some Callisto because if not, you wouldn't be using it. And when this field's checker striped in a week, we'll know who else is to blame. Good old friend atrazine. I know some people are inevitably going to ask, these white buildings you see on these farms, our water wells for our local water cooperative. Although we own this farm and the water rights, they were leased out for over 100 years, probably 70 or 80 years ago. There'll be some negotiating coming one of these days because they pull a lot of water off of us. We've got a really high water table in this area. This farm in particular has a lot of gravel underneath it, so that allows that water to kind of sit in there and be easy to access. Because of that, it's also prone to drought stress. I could definitely drive faster. If you look at this road though, and the tracks that previous tractors have left, I'm not too motivated to get that road oil all over my sprayer. Another lesson learned, spraying at an angle isn't much more enjoyable than spraying crossways. I'm already committed on this little field. When I move to the north side of the lane, I'm gonna try spraying with the rows. Time to stop being lazy. I think I can do it. Okay, we're on the next field. We're gonna try spraying this straight. Called this neighbor to the east here. 
We know Kevin very well. We know most of our neighbors other than some of the people in Tower Hill because that's way far away. I asked him what kind of beans he had because I was thinking about spraying over on him a little bit. He's got Enlist beans. I've got Extend Flex beans. They share a mutual tolerance to Liberty or Glufosinate, which is what we're spraying. That's one of the nice things about having the Liberty in there and not using the dicamba or the Extend part of the genetic tolerance here. Most beans across the countryside are either Extend Flex or Enlist. And since theirs are Enlist, I'm going to go ahead and hang over on them. That way, when they come to spray their Enlist, they don't have to get super close to us because I've cooked their beans. Cooked their beans is the wrong term. I haven't cooked their beans, I've cooked their weeds. If they get too close with their Enlist on us, they will kill our beans. So it's kind of a best of both worlds scenario here. I was here first, I'll take care of the property line and then some. I stand corrected about it being smoother if you go with the row. I just don't think our corn stalks are smooth regardless of how you approach them. It actually doesn't seem that challenging to stay in between the rows though. So this may be how I spray everything so long as all of my rows are planted straight. Bean planter did a lot better than the corn planter in terms of keeping very straight rows. Is anyone here interested in this old barn? You can have it as long as you take the old mold bore plow with you. I don't think this barn's got many days left in its life because it's starting to crumble. That'll be a fun one to pick up when it's on the couple hundred acres we have behind it. Oh well, all good things must come to an end. I'll be darned. It is possible without much effort. I rode those beans. You probably can't tell from the camera. There are a few spots where I pulled down some of the exterior foliage. The main stem is unaffected. I don't know if I'll be able to come back in fungicide time and not pull down these beans because they'll be so big, but I guess we'll cross that bridge when it comes. I'd rather have the vegetative tissue out there fighting off weeds because everywhere I run over is probably going to have some kind of weed pressure. On to the next field though. Oh man, this one's probably a losing battle. I can't help it that people literally put their gardens in the property of this field. They think it's some kind of right away. It's not. And your tomatoes are dead, ma'am. I'm sorry. It happens. It's not like it matters. By the time they figure out what happened to their tomato plants, I'll be halfway to Mexico. Home sweet home. All things considered, today was a great day just because nothing terrible went wrong. Your first day out doing something new is never as productive as you see it in your crystal ball. I had a little bit of learning to do. I didn't talk a whole lot about what was going on. I'll do that in the next video when we hit the ground really running hard, spraying the rest of our liberty. I've only got three fields left of it to spray, but those three fields are almost 600 acres. So should be pretty quick there. Maybe get it knocked out tomorrow. Helena is only gonna be open tomorrow until noon because it's Saturday and they're trying to do their best to keep their health happy. As a farmer, you'd wish that they'd be open all day. At the same time, you have to be considerate because they have a hard enough time, and not just them, all of the retailers, I'm sure, across the country, keeping employees because it's hard to keep them happy and motivated to work hard when you make them work seven days a week every week. So they start to give them Saturdays and Sundays off when things kind of slow down. I've only taken the tiniest nibble out of our acres I need to spray for soybean post. I'm not even remotely concerned about getting it done because there's not a single chance of rain in the next two weeks. So probably not gonna be a whole lot of new weeds emerging or lack of opportunity to get out and spray the fields. Anyways, I will talk way more about this in the next episode. For now though, I'm gonna take off and enjoy this Friday evening with my family. As always, I greatly appreciate every single one of you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you wanna see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace.